All right, in this video, we're gonna explore a few more phenomena that have gotten a lot of attention, no pun intended, in cognitive psychology in recent years. So we'll see how attention plays a role in our everyday experience and some of the benefits, as well as how it can sometimes fail us. I wanna start us off with just a reminder of something you no doubt already know, which is that where, atten where we attend, where we're paying attention, is not always the same as where we're looking. So like your eyes can be pointing in one direction, fixating on one part of a scene, while your attention is actually focused elsewhere, in which case your brain may be processing that peripheral information more heavily than the info that's right in front of our eyes. So we'll often talk about overt attention as the usual, usual situation, where you're looking at the same place you're attending, like you're having a nice conversation with your date, you're looking at her or him while being totally engrossed in that conversation. On the other hand, covert attention is when your attentional focus is somewhere other than where your eyes are focusing. Like if you're zoned out in a boring first date conversation and peripherally you're, you're watching a golden retriever puppy off to your left get tangled up in its, in its leash. So you're covertly attending to the puppy even though there's no sign of it in your gaze and where you're looking. And interestingly, when you shift your attentional focus without shifting your eyes, without changing the visual stimulus at all, we can see that change happen in your brain. So covertly attending to something often like your left periphery is going to cause extra activity in your right hemisphere. Because remember, we're wired contralaterally. So things in your left periphery go to the right hemisphere and things in your right uh, periphery go to the left hemisphere. So covertly attending to your right side, sure enough, makes the left hemisphere activate more, showing that your brain is doing extra processing for information coming in from that part of the visual field. And that's without moving your eyes at all, just paying attention to that side of space, which actually tells us that attention is a top-down mechanism, right? Because the bottom-up stimulus, the input to our retina, is identical, but we end up processing things differently and perceiving things differently depending on where our attention is focused. Now, I wanna briefly mention just some some benefits of attention so that we understand why we'd have this thing that's so independent from where we're looking rather than just always going along with our eye movement. So for one thing, attention, attending to something or, or to somewhere speeds our responses. Probably the most famous example of this comes from uh, Posner's queuing studies. So this researcher Posner, he brought participants into a lab and, and their task was to look at a fixation point and then push a button when a square shows up off in the periphery. Easy peasy, right? So you're just pressing, was the square on the right or the left? Just push a button. And to make it even easier, he had it added like a hint. At the start of each trial, an arrow would pop up directing their attention to one side or the other. And again, this is without moving their eyes. They still have to fixate at the middle. The whole trial, they're still looking at the middle. Without moving their eyes, it just tells them, pay attention over to this side of space. Like basically the arrow saying, get ready for a box over here on the right. And then when the box shows up in the right periphery, they've got to press a button. And in the experiment that he did, 80% of the time the arrow was accurate. It was an accurate hint. It matched the side the square would show up on. But 20% of the time it actually pointed in the wrong direction. Basically it was an invalid cue that brought their attention to the, to the side that the box wouldn't be showing up on. So that's his design. What did he find? Now, whether the arrow was valid or invalid, remember, they're still staring at the fixation point in the middle. So the same image is hitting their retina, so there's no difference there, but he found that covertly attending to one side makes it quicker to process information in that location where we're attending. So on the trials where the arrow had sent their attention to the correct side, their reaction time was under 250 milliseconds, under a quarter of a second. Well, it was about a 20th of a second slower Right, worse reaction time, longer reaction time in the invalid trials. So attending to something or to somewhere lets us process the information faster and thus react faster. There's another benefit, which is the things we attend to, they actually get perceived differently. Like when we're attending to, not, not looking at, but when we're just paying attention to something, even if it's just covert attention, that thing will stand out more. It'll get perceived as bigger, faster, having richer colors, more contrast. Um, for example, there's a 2004 study. They, they had participants fixate in the middle of the screen, looking at this fixation dot then their attention was drawn to one side or the other without actually moving their eyes. So that's a little cue getting flashed there, goes to one side. After that, two stimuli are gonna show up, one on the left and one on the right. And again, their attention has been covertly drawn to one of those sides. Now the participants task, what they're told to do, 
was just to indicate the orientation of whichever of these grading patches has the highest contrast. So I was trying to figure out which of these two uh, circular like grading patterns, which of these is a more high contrast one. So for a lot of trials, one of these circular patches that had, had way more contrast than the other. And we can usually pick that up pretty easily. Although for some trials, they, they made the difference kind of subtle. So it's, you know, it's still a little bit challenging for people. But the key is, occasionally the researchers did a trial where the contrast was actually identical. So both of these things are basically the same on each side. There's no real difference there. Uh, neither, neither patch had more contrast. And in that case, the side that attention had been covertly drawn to by that little queuing procedure, the side that they were attending to without actually looking over there, that side was consistently perceived as being higher contrast. And we find similar results for colors on one side seeming richer if we're paying covert attention to that side and so on. Uh, finally, another benefit of attention, we, we know that it synchronizes activity in different brain regions. Like this study here, it's from 2012, they used an animal model. Um, they were measuring brain activity in monkeys. Well, they did a very simple task, like just flashing some things in front of them and manipulating their attention. So they had the monkey fixate on a fixation point so it wouldn't actually move its eyes to the stimuli that showed up on the screen. It's always staring at the same place. Then they would flash a stimulus on the screen off in the periphery somewhere and note the activity in some areas of the brain, like the activity that comes just from processing a visual stimulus showing up in front of you. For example, flashing stimulus one maybe would, would activate areas A and C in the brain, whereas flashing a different stimulus, like stimulus two somewhere else, that activates areas B and C in the brain, right? Maybe some overlap, but distinct areas, okay? Straightforward enough. But then they drew the monkey's attention covertly. So without actually looking, the monkey's still fixating on the fixation point, but they drew the monkey's attention to one of the places, one of the stimuli. And on those trials, where the monkey was paying attention to the stimulus rather than just passively processing it off in the periphery, it did not change which brain regions were activated. That makes sense. Like it was still A and C activating for stimulus one. And it actually didn't change the amount of activity in A and C in these kind of earlier visual areas. But attending to that place does increase the synchronization of those two brain areas. Like when we're looking at A and C, the two areas in the brain, we see that they're more synchronized. There's more coherence when we're paying attention. Like you can see how in this uh, top version here, the, the no attention condition, when, when they weren't attending, it just kind of showed up in their periphery. The, like the squiggly lines here, they don't synchronize, right? The ups and downs come at opposite times. But now look at the bottom graph in the attention condition. This is where they are paying attention when it, when it comes up there. And the waves of activity in, in both these two brain regions, like A and C, they kind of go together, right? We're, we're seeing um, they kind of peak and trough at the same time. Likewise, for attending to stimulus two, we got the same kind of thing where it was, you know, areas B and C for stimulus two. But again, we get more synchronization if they're attending to it. So attention affects neural processing, which we can see even more evidence of in, in studies of humans. Like in this one paradigm, we might show two images superimposed on each other, like a face and a house, right? When looking at something like this, Normally, people's attention, if they just look at it for a while, their attention will kind of flip back and forth between attending a little more to the face or attending a little more to the house when you're looking at it, right? We can just kind of, uh, maybe in, in a laboratory, we might instruct people and say, I want you to attend to the face, for example. And when people are attending to the face, the fusiform face area, the FFA, the face area in the, in the ventral stream in the brain is more active. But for the exact same image in front of their eyes, the exact same proximal stimulus hitting their retina, when we tell them to attend to the house or when they happen, happen to tell us that they just happen to flip, they're paying more attention to the house now, an area called the parahippocampal place area, long name, but this place area in the brain is active. It's called the place area because it normally activates selectively just for places when we're looking at things like buildings, but not other things. So again, attending to something affects neural processing without ever moving our eyes. But let's move things out of the laboratory briefly. Let's apply some of this stuff with a fun little magic trick. All throughout the video so far, I have been secretly planting some cues. And if I've done everything correctly, there's a good chance I can control your behavior and your choices. So in a moment, I'm gonna show you a set of cards very briefly. So it's gonna come up on the screen pretty quickly. You'll have to do this fast. 
As soon as those cards uh, pop up on the screen, you have to pick one of the cards and memorize it, okay? It's gonna go pretty fast and it's really important that you don't forget your card, okay? Here we go. Okay, that went fast, but hopefully you picked and memorized your card. Don't forget where your card was. In fact, to make sure you don't forget, you should say your card out loud. Like, go ahead, say it out loud a couple of times. Okay, you should have it now for sure, right? And if I did the first part right, I already know exactly what card you picked, even though I wasn't in the room with you and can't possibly hear what you say out loud, right? But magic is powerful. And sometimes maybe it even transcends space and time. So now I want you to concentrate as hard as possible on your card vividly imagine sending the information of your card to me telepathically. Imagine the card zooming through time and space to reach me at the time in the past when I'm making this video, okay? Concentrate real hard, go ahead. Concentrate on your card. Okay, I, I think I'm feeling something. This is crazy, I, th I think I'm getting it, right? Wow, okay. Well, I think I know what your card is based on what I'm feeling, so let's see if it worked. I'm now gonna remove the card that I made you choose. So did it work? Did I remove the right card? Did I remove your card? If it worked, if I remove the right card, you might be having a bit of a mind blown moment right now. Like this shouldn't work according to everything we know about physics, right? And that's true. There is no such thing as real magic in, in this sense. There's no such thing as telepathy. Instead, this was a simple trick using the power of attention. You see, the six original cards that you saw the ones you picked from, those were all removed. So no matter what you picked, it was gonna be gone. I put up five brand new face cards on the later screen. So if I do this for a big crowd, I've done this before for a big crowd, usually a few people will figure it out as it's happening. But for most of us, the explanation doesn't occur to us immediately. And it seems kind of crazy that it worked. So what happened here was actually just a normal everyday failure of your attention. Because you were so busy attending to your card, that you didn't attend to the other ones. So you had no way to know when they had changed. To really understand what's happening here, let's watch a little video clip. See if you can solve this whodunit murder mystery. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Oh, it's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe. <laughs> now, if you were really paying attention, it's possible you noticed some of those things change. But now imagine you weren't watching a video about attention right now and didn't just get tricked a moment ago by a card trick before this. So if you didn't have any clue that things might change, you're super unlikely to notice it when things change, even when those changes are pretty huge. In fact, this happens all the time in Hollywood blockbusters. Like a little wardrobe mistake or a screw up with the props where something will change between cuts, you would think it would be pretty noticeable, but we almost never see it as audience members because we're not focusing our attention on the objects in the scene so much as the dialogue and the action. So these are called continuity errors, and, and actually the job of the script supervisor is to avoid these as much as possible. 
But when a movie is shot across, you know, many months and the same scene might be reshot on different days, it's hard to catch every single detail. Thankfully, we, the audience members, don't usually notice this because our attention is not perfect and it's not unlimited. So that's what I want to talk about in the rest of this video, failures of attention like this. Uh, first off, the one we've been talking about with the, the card trick and the whodunit mystery and continuity errors in movies, that all comes from an effect that cognitive psychologists have dubbed change blindness. We fail to notice changes to a scene if we weren't paying attention to that specific thing or that specific location in the scene. Like, all throughout the day, the scenes around us are filled with details that we don't attend to, and thus, we're unlikely to remember them. When you uh, walk past a doorman on the way into a fancy hotel, you probably don't pay too much attention to the color of his shoes, even though that information definitely hits your eyes. So then when you leave the hotel, even 20 minutes later, you're unlikely to notice if the guy has changed his shoes. Hell, you're unlikely to notice if it's a different man entirely. Researchers actually once did a study where they had one research assistant check a person in for the study, just at the front desk, they come in for the study, one research assistant checks them in, and then bends down behind a counter to grab some papers, and sneakily, a totally different guy stood back up with the papers and handed it to the person. And sure enough, many of the participants didn't realize that in a period of five seconds, the person they'd been talking to was replaced by someone else. We generally only consciously process and, and remember like the gist of a scene, the gist of things that we're going through, not every detail we're exposed to. Memory is definitely not like a photograph or a video. So a lot of the information just doesn't get saved in our brain unless we're attending to it. Let's actually see a laboratory version of this and please forgive the bad acting by these students. This is a movie perception test. Watch this brief video of a conversation, and then I'll ask you some questions about it. Hi, Sabina. Hi. Well, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Yeah, it's great to see you, Andrea. So how did you get here? Oh, I took the subway from Middleton, and it took only about half an hour. Really? I drove from Gresham, and it took 45 minutes. Hmm, hooray for public transportation. So why did you call me here for this mysterious meeting? I'm planning a surprise party for Jerome, and I need your help to keep him away from the house. That's great. I'll do anything you need. Good. I hate surprise parties, but only when I'm the victim. Otherwise, they're great. Very good. Other than the strange dialogue about a surprise party, did you notice anything unusual? So you might pause and think through how many things you noticed. The movie you just watched had nine intentional editing mistakes. Did you spot any of them? Watch it again. Notice that the woman on the right, Sabrina, is wearing a scarf. In a moment we'll have a close-up and the scarf will be gone. Notice the scarf is gone and Andrea, the woman on the left, has her arm on the table. Now it's at her chin. Scarf is back. Notice that the plates are red. Now they're white and Andrea's arm is back on the table. Now they're red and Sabrina's arm is off of the table. Notice that the food is in front of Sabrina. Now it's in front of Andrea. The cups and the spoon have also switched places, and Sabrina's arm is on the table when it wasn't before. Now, you probably Most saw some of don't those. notice any of the changes, a phenomenon known as change blindness. But most people are confident that they would notice the changes. That is the illusion of memory. Like... We've been primed. You're watching a video right now. We've been talking about this stuff, right? So you probably did notice some of those changes because you're looking for them. In fact, if I had instructed you to look for changes in the objects in the scene, you could have probably caught most of them. But in that case, if you're spending so much attention looking at the objects for changes, by drawing your attention so heavily to those objects, what we find is that you'll actually have way less memory of, of what the people were talking about. So our attention is limited. We have to choose what's important to focus on, which is what we'll be more likely to encode and remember in our memory. Now let's see a quick demonstration of change blindness with some fun little gifts. So in each of these, something is gonna change about the scene you're looking at when a flash happens, then it'll change back on the next flash, and it'll keep flipping back and forth between two versions of the same scene. Let's see how quickly you can pick up on the changes. So forget the checkerboard, that's just visual masking, just kind of to distract you, that's the flash. But something's changing in the actual scene between the two versions. 
You may have already seen it, but if not, keep looking for differences between each version. And if I told you to look in kind of the lower side, maybe the lower right side, pay attention to the shadow, now it becomes much more obvious. And once you've seen it, it's very obvious, but now you can attend to that, right? You've noticed it. Let's do another one. Each time it flashes, something's changing in the scene. So you might look at the wine glass, the food on the table, the guy's face. It might take a bit, but eventually, if I tell you to look at the background behind them, and specifically the bar, then you notice the bar is going up and down. Okay, let's do another one. Something's changing each time it flashes. And again, on some of these, you might get it right away, and on others, it might take you forever. <laughs> it's totally normal. So if I told you, maybe as a hint, maybe you were looking at the pictures in the lower left, or you're looking at the cars off on the right, or maybe you're attending to the windows on the far left, but it's actually the big building in the background in the middle top, that building is shifting. And maybe you see that, maybe you didn't see that initially, but now that, now that I've pointed it out, it should be really obvious, drawing your attention there. Now we'll do one more, just a heads up, this next one flashes back and forth really fast. So if you happen to have epilepsy, just to be safe, you might close your eyes or look away for the next slide, although it's not at a frequency that should have any risk. So here we go. So this one, it's flipping back and forth a lot faster, but something is changing each time. See if you can spot it. Might be a little harder. I guess the hint is uh, it's some vegetation that's changing. And specifically, you know, near the middle to the left, just to the left of the Sphinx's head there's a tree showing up and disappearing. So, okay, now, these are examples of, of change blindness. And you might have seen something similar as like a little video game you can play in bars where you have to spot the difference between two pictures. It's a fun little bar game, right? And oddly enough, research has shown that intoxicated participants, so you bring people into a lab, get some people drunk and some people not, people with like a blood alcohol content of 0.71 to 0.82, so fairly intoxicated, they spot differences between pictures like this faster than sober participants do. They do worse on other cognitive tasks. So alcohol definitely impairs cognitive tasks like memory and things like that, definitely worse, but they do better here. So what's going on? Well, alcohol is a depressant, right? Meaning it lowers activity of the central nervous system. So one thing that intoxication decreases, lowers the activity of, is attentional control, which shifts us to, to like more of a passive processing or a more diffuse and kind of non-directed attentional state. And by the way, if you're looking for differences in these two pictures, the difference is this little street lamp up here, this little street light, which isn't there in that one. Okay, by the way, just to connect change blindness back to that idea of magic, like stage magicians using misdirection, uh, researchers, some of whom are actually stage magicians or ex-magicians who became co cognitive psychologists, uh, researchers have brought magic kind of into the lab. Like one study did a coin swapping sleight of hand trick in front of participants while using eye tracking, or there have been like drop tricks where you drop an item and, and use eye tracking to see who catches it and who doesn't. Well, others don't necessarily do a magic trick in the experiment per se, but test the principles of misdirection in, in a more controlled manner to understand why magic works, like why for stage magic, right? Like this, for example, this 2009 study titled As If by Magic. In this one, they had participants watching this uh, set of six circular patches where each circle is at a particular angle, right? So like this one's going kind of diagonal, this one's a little more flat, this one's vertical lines, right? So each of these patches is at a particular angle with the lines inside of it. And the whole set of all six of these patches, it moved as a group, like it moved in one direction down the screen. So it's moving in one direction, and then when it gets near the edge of the screen, it would switch and start moving in a different direction. But again, all together as a group, okay? Participants are watching this the whole time, and the task of the participant is to identify which of these six circles suddenly changes its angle at some point during this process. So in each trial, as this big set moves, one of these, like this one that's vertical, might swap and become horizontal, okay? So that's, that's the idea. You're just trying to catch which one of them changed. Now, if we're watching it normally without the whole set of them moving, we can usually catch the change with no problem, right? We're looking right at it. We know what to look for. 
Now, in this study, they had two conditions for when one of those circles changed to become a different angle, right? So it either happened right when the whole set was changing paths, going from like vertical to horizontal, or in a control condition, the flip happened, the change from like vertical to horizontal, that changed when it was going straight, like in, in one of these paths, in the middle of a path. And as you can see by the data on the right, people usually spot which one changed, which of these circles changed, if it happens in the control condition. When it's just all going in a straight line and one of them suddenly switches and you're watching it the whole time, you'll notice it usually. But they tend to miss it most of the time if it happens right as the other change is occurring. Basically, uh, that other change, the change in the, the whole direction of the whole pack, that acts as a misdirection. The same way a stage magician might use misdirection by doing something salient and flashy and obvious, so that you're less likely to see the other change that's happening simultaneously in plain sight. And that, that's kind of the key here. In this study, the changes were happening right where people were looking, in the same part of space they were attending to, but their attention was drawn to the salient and obvious movement change, so they couldn't as easily process the, the angle change in one of those circles. Of course, when I say stage magicians uh, utilize like implicit knowledge of how attention works, that doesn't mean they're only taking advantage of change blindness. There are a number of other ways you can manipulate attention if you know how it works. So in the next video, we'll talk about a couple other ways that attention can fail us and connect it back to some more general theories of how it all fits together.